welcome uh, to our uh, slightly different uh, club meeting uh, 2020. It is uh, slightly different because of the uh, pandemic uh, that is uh, uh, at least uh, for the time being getting uh, worse and worse every day. I do not know uh, the actual figures of, of today, uh, but they should be known. Uh, yesterday we had uh, uh, more than 500 uh, new infections uh, alone in uh, the prefecture of, of Tokyo. So this is uh, going to go on and uh, we are afraid that uh, we will not be able to do our uh, next symposium, which is uh, scheduled uh, to be in uh, Berlin, uh, featuring uh, one of the uh, symposia that are going to be held celebrating 160 years of uh, German-Japanese uh, uh, diplomatic relations. But uh, for the time being, we, uh, of course, cannot say anything whether we will be able to do it uh, or not. So doing a club meeting of the members in Japan, of course, is an experiment. I am very happy that uh, we can do it by Zoom uh, because I had have an experience of uh, more than half a year using Zoom uh, for my lectures at the university. Um, all the uh, speakers of today are here. Uh, this is my home in Tokyo because uh, the university did not want to accept us uh, because one, some of the speakers uh, are not uh, belonging to Meiji University and they were afraid that they were carrying the coronavirus inside. So this is uh, my home and uh, as I said, all the speakers are with me here in this uh, room. Um, we would like um, to take a screenshot uh, in between uh, to use the screenshot as uh, our Christmas and New Year's card. So um, if you don't mind uh, please uh, keep your cameras on. Mm -hmm. uh, we would like uh, to use that uh, for uh, the, the Christmas card, as I said. Uh, the program uh, that was made available to you uh, has not changed. So we will start with um, a presentation by uh, Professor uh, Harald uh, Kleinschmidt, uh, who is one of the uh, few uh, German-speaking uh, scientists um, who are uh, working or who can work as an historian in Japan because of his fluency uh, in the Japanese language. Uh, we know each other already uh, for uh, quite some uh, time, but this is uh, the first time that Professor Kleinschmidt is uh, giving a presentation here. Please. Wonderful. Okay. So, um, yeah, now, now I think you can hear me. Um, um, welcome to this. Um, gathering. Um, I'm Harald Kleinschmidt and I've been asked to um, present to you a short survey 
of the um, transformations of cultural and science relations between Europe and Germany on the one side, Japan on the other. So the title is a bit complicated because um, there are two processes that are taking place, have been taking place simultaneously. One process, uh, the gradual nationalization of bilateral relations between Europe and Japan on the, other, on the one side. Uh, on the other process, uh, the gradual degradation of the European image of Japan as this process goes on. Um, and um, although I don't believe that the two processes are causally correlated, uh, there is a temporal coincidence between these two processes. So let me begin with um, a map. Um, can, I, can I ask you, can they see the map? Yes, everybody can see it. Yes. Okay, I, I'm, I hope you can see the map um, that I have been uh, putting on my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, this is a map um, dating from the middle of... Is it okay? Um, this is a map dating from the middle of the 13th century, and what you see is a circle um, in, in the blackish, blackish color. This means the ocean. And within the ocean, there's only one ocean, there is the land. And if you look at this land, uh, if you would look at it in detail, you would see that there are no human made borders at all, but three continents tied together within this ocean circle. The upper part is Asia, the lower right part is Africa and the lower left part is Europe. And if you look at the very top of the map, uh, you see an island which is located in the ocean. Um, it is this island that, according to medieval geography, houses paradise on earth. And as this place, paradise on earth, is supposed to be in the most upper, in the uppermost part of the world, it is at the top. And in most, in most passages of the Old Testament, the terrestrial paradise is located in Asia. Therefore, Asia always takes the upper half of these world maps and the island is in the uppermost part and that means the easternmost part of the world as depicted in the 13th century. This, by the way, is the largest extent map that we have from the Middle Ages, from medieval Europe uh, it is preserved in the Cathedral Church of Hereford in Western England. Now, um, why I'm showing this map? The reason is that this island, which you see in the very top of the map, where according to biblical tradition, terrestrial paradise is located, this is the island at to which, or in the proximity of which, Marco Polo believed to have traveled when he visited East Asia, uh, which he called Mangi, which we call China today, um, in the latter part of the 13th century. Now, Marco Polo, of course, never came to that island, but he reported on an island which he had heard is a little far away from the Chinese eastern coasts, and to which he gave the name Shipangu which is a slight variation of the Chinese um, expression for what we call Japan today. Um, so Marco Polo, while not saying that Chipango is identical with terrestrial paradise, described Chipango in phrases and gave it a kind of uh, metaphorical color, which was very, very similar to terrestrial paradise. Among other things, he argued that gold grows in Chipangu in very large quantities, alongside with uh, lots of other precious things, herbs, stones, and so forth. Uh, and in saying so, Marco Polo created a tradition which, in the last resort, lasted until the middle of the 19th century. Um, Um, to continue, 
um, later in the 15th century, when um, Marco Polo's book about his travels was read very widely, um, we have, as you may know, um, the first terrestrial globe manufactured by a man named Martin Beheim in Nuremberg in 1492. And Beheim, copying Marco Polo, also knew that much gold grows in Chipango. And he says explicitly, so writes Marco Polo. And what Marco Polo said is true by definition. Not only Beheim thought so, Christopher Columbus said, thought the same. On his first voyage across the Atlantic, he encountered an island, which we don't know which it was, in the Caribbean Sea. And we don't know how he talked to the people there, because there cannot have been any translators. But somehow, he was given to understand, or at least he felt to have understood, that there was a place on this island where people would go for gold. And they, they called this place Chibao. And Columbus concluded that this must have been Chipang. Um, further in the, into the 16th century, then gold doesn't grow anymore in Chipangu, but still there is lots of gold available there. So among other things, Marco Polo also said that there was a famous battle which um, had been fought in the 13th century. Incidentally, this is a battle uh, which took place while Marco Polo was in China, namely the Battle of Hakata Bay, 1284, uh, which was uh, the second attempt by Kublai Khan to conquer Japan. Marco Polo reported on this battle. And so ironically, we have known in Europe some occurrences in Japanese history long from a time long before anyone from Europe set feet on the archipelago. Uh, and this uh, tradition of Marco Polo goes on way down um, into um, uh, the 16th, 17th, and 18th century. By the time we get into the 16th century, we see the first Europeans actually coming to Japan. Um, the most important thing they brought, um, among nasty things like syphilis, uh, they, the, important, the most important things they brought are weapons. Um, uh, there's a story about these um, firearms, um, which was reported in uh, a year which we cannot really identify, 14, 1542 or 1543, um, which gave, gives us an impression that uh, these firearms were somewhat different from the kinds of weapons that uh, were used in Japan, but the interpretation uh, that one must use these firearms with an upright heart and mind, and one must have a straight body and nurse a pure life force, and last but not least, one must have fine eyesight in order to uh, handle these weapons. And if one has the, all these moral and physical qualifications, the weapons reach their target by themselves. This is an interpretation which is strongly um, parallel to traditional um, Japanese um, martial arts, uh, for example, um, Kyudo, which um, has similar imagery. And so this goes on uh, way down um, into the 60, further 16th century and then into the 17th century. By the 17th century, we get certain problems coming up. As people began to know Japan more closely, mainly through reports from Jesuit missionaries who had come here in the second half of the 16th century, um, people started to worry about uh, the system of rulership as it um, seemed to emerge. And um, it seemed from a European point of view quite strange that um, there appear to be two rulers acting somehow simultaneously. Um, uh, one of the most learned people in Europe in the 16th century, um, a medical scholar, but also a jurist, Hermann Conring, uh, argued that the relationship between these two rulers was similar 
to the relationship between uh, the king and uh, sort of the mayor of the palace in the ancient uh, Frankish kingdom in Europe, um, seventh, eighth centuries. Another um, scholar argued that um, the two rulers, uh, came, the, the system of two rulers came into existence because there had been at some remote uh, time in the past, there had been some revolution according to which um, the former central sole ruler had not been deposed, but uh, sort of pushed away into um, the um, uh, to a, a position where he had no real power. So the revolutionary tradition or the um, semi-constitutional uh, interpretation where um, uh, current the second problem that occurred in uh, with regard to um, European perceptions of Japan was a problem um, related to time. Um, uh, way down to the end of the 18th century, the biblical chronology of um, a very limited time frame, namely altogether around 6,000 years from the creation of the world to the end of the world was adhered to, and that meant that all world history ought to have taken place in a relatively short period of time. And then, however, by the 16th century, Jesuit scholars working in China discovered that there was a Chinese historic tradition which was far too old to match these 6,000 year limits. So how do we explain? that there can be a part of the world as shown in the 13th century map, that there can be a part of the world where the time frame seems to extend beyond the limits of biblical predictions. Um, uh, one solution offered in the second half of the 17th century was to identify the mythical first ruler of China with the biblical figure of Noah. And so to argue that people in East Asia had moved after the flood directly from Western Asia all the way down to Eastern Asia. This myth, of course, depends on the world map that you see where the world is permeable. In other words, one can walk all over without having to cross an ocean. This uh, problem was a, was a very serious one, which haunted um, scholars throughout the 17th and much of the 18th century, until by the end of the 18th century, the biblical chronology was given up, and then this problem ceased to exist. As you see, um, so far, knowing Japan in Europe was a European affair. We have people from all over the continent um, working together to trying to crack some of these riddles that appear to exist in European perception of East Asia, in the European perception of East Asia. The third problem that came up um, was, uh, oh, yeah, the third problem came up in uh, one of the most important works that, um, on, that was um, written and uh, published uh, about Japan by um, a physician and scholar named Engelbert Kempfer um, very early in the 18th century. He put up a question that um, uh, yeah, has haunted people, people's minds based in Europe or in the West basically until today. Namely, um, the um, government in Japan early in the 17th century had um, invoked a policy according to which um, migration or even travel out of Japan was strictly prohibited and um, trade from by outside traders, non-Japanese traders uh, had been subject to very strict ruler, rules. Uh, so that in the last resort by the 1630s, only 
one European trading company, the Dutch East India Company, uh, uh, retained its privilege to do trade with Japan, the only Europeans, um, the only European trading company who could legally do trade. Kempfer struggled with this problem, tried to give an interpretation. And his interpretation was uh, derived from his experience in Ayutthaya in Siam, Thailand, where he had stayed a little more than a year before coming to Japan. Um, and uh, he visited Thailand, uh, Siam, Thailand, at a time when um, there was a, a very open uh, government uh, briefly in office. So Siam, Thailand appeared to, to Kempfer as a very open uh, state where basically everyone could do, every, every foreigner could do whatever he or she wished. In Japan, this seemed different because there were these strict trading um, regulations. So um, uh, Kempfer argued that compared to Siam, Thailand, uh, Japan was a closed country. He didn't mean that Japan was an isolated country. He knew very well that trade was possible, uh, but he interpreted the strict trade regulations with the word closed country. This phrase, um, the closed country, came to be rendered into Japanese following Kempfer's text by uh, um, uh, an astronomer uh, named Shizuki Tarao uh, around 1800. Uh, Shizuki Tarao was asked uh, to do something like um, European research. And um, as he knew Dutch, uh, he was um, commissioned to translate a vernacular version of Kempfer's book into Japanese. Uh, he did a part, part, he translated a part of this uh, two volume book. Um, and the part that he translated was the part where Kempfer interpreted Japan as a closed country. And Shizuki Tadao rendered this um, uh, phrase, closed country, into Japanese under the term sakoku. Uh, this is a neologism. Uh, that occurred first in uh, Shizuki's printed version um, under the title Sakoku Ron, uh, printed in 1801. So from that time on, Japan learned from Kempfer that it was a closed country. Uh, this phrase had not been in existence before. Now, um, the European the common European tradition of interpreting Japan more or less appropriately, rather less than more appropriately, came to an abrupt end at the time when um, uh, both the US government and various European governments put pressure on the Japanese government to quote unquote open the country. This is sort of the return to, um, or the return, the turn away from Kempfer's argument that Japan was closed. And now diplomats and traders took the view that what they believed was a closed country should be opened. Ironically, uh, at the same time, when the first Europeans um, uh, uh, came to Japan after um, uh, the middle of the 1850s, the European image or the Western image of Japan suddenly turned sour. Uh, among the first reports that we have from the 1850s, uh, we still see a legacy of Marco Polo's images. Uh, Japan has plenty of everything. Uh, for example, uh, the official letter which the US president, Mr. Um, Fillmore, sent to uh, the shogun of uh, Japan requesting the opening of the archipelago. In this official letter, the US president claimed that Japan was full of coal, that there was so much coal in Japan that by no means could the Japanese people use all that coal. So would they please sell a bit of that coal to US citizens who wanted to use their steamers to maintain the trade between California and China. 
So here you see uh, the uh, legacy of Marco Polo's idea that there's plenty of everything um, in Japan. A few years later, we see that the image turns radically negative. Japan is, an, is a country where we have earthquakes and fires and where people get killed for no reason, where they get uh, hanged for no reason, uh, which is dangerous and where the trade is not actually worthwhile doing it because, well, the Japanese can't produce anything by themselves. And this negative image continues way down to the end of the 19th century, even beginning of the 20th century. Uh, still in the 1930s uh, in Nazi Germany, there was um, a rather well-known uh, economist who in all seriousness argued that Japanese matches were far below the standard of German matches and ought not to be produced. Uh, too dangerous, they argued. Um, in the meantime, we do get the first um, efforts to um, penetrate somewhat more deeply into um, Japanese language and culture. Uh, the first academic actually um, who um, worked on Japan, on, on Japanese, was an Austrian professor of comparative um, linguistics named Anton Boller, who was a member of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Um, he learned Japanese by himself based on a collection that had been uh, uh, brought to Vienna from uh, one of the most um, active collectors early in the 19th century, Philipp Franz von Siebold. Boller uh, provided um, a number of um, interpretations of the Japanese language. Uh, a second member of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, August Fitzmaier, uh, joined him and translated. He also studied Japanese by himself, learned Japanese by himself, he translated uh, classical Japanese texts into German. The first chair of Japanese was established at Leiden University, again drawing on uh, the heritage of Philipp Franz von Siebold, that part which ended in the Netherlands. The, incumbent, the first incumbent was Johann, Ho Johann, Johann Ho Josef Hoffmann, um, who worked in Leiden for more than 20 years and published, um, among other things, a Japanese Dutch dictionary. Um, he was joined uh, as a linguist by um, um, uh, Leon Rosny, um, who obtained a professorship in Japanese at the Ecole Spéciale des Langues Orientales in Paris in 1868, and also uh, authored dictionaries and uh, numerous works on Japan. Incidentally, there's also a chair uh, not a chair, professorship in uh, Japanese studies at the University of Florence, um, where a geographer, Carlo Puini, uh, taught Japanese for a very long time from 1877 to 1921. Germany comes late. Um, uh, there was a professorship of East Asian language at the University of Berlin. Uh, and then in 1887, uh, the university uh, opened its seminar, Seminary for Oriental Languages, which was basically a training ground for diplomats. This was then uh, an official uh, place to study also East Asian languages, and there was a lectureship in Japanese there. The first professorship in Japanese um, uh, was established in 1914. At, um, the, at the Colonial Institute of Hamburg University under uh, Karl Adolf Florenz, who had been a teacher in German living in Japan from 1889 to 1914. And then he returned as a professor in Jap of Japanese. Uh, among other things, um, uh, many other disciplines um, not focused on Japan, obtain the relationship uh, with East Asia. Uh, these are disciplines mainly conducted under the um, foreign employees of the Meiji government, 
from 1868 on to the beginning of World War I. Um, uh, the best known representatives are Alvin Belt for medicine, who stayed in Japan, stayed and taught in Japan for 29 years up until 1905. Um, some engineers or scientists called Neto, a metallurgist and collector of art, um, uh, to name only one of them. And then in law, we have um, Hermann Rösler, quite a controversial figure from a German point of view, because as a professor of law in Mecklenburg, he converted to Catholicism and um, that was disliked a great deal. Uh, and so, uh, so was his activity as um, an, a foreign employee of the major government disliked by a German consular and diplomatic agencies because he was considered untrustworthy. Uh, to name uh, one of the arts, um, uh, a Navy officer named Franz Eckert um, wrote a preliminary version of the harmony for the Japanese national anthem. Uh, the notes were published in 1881. Um, uh, soon, some academic societies were established. Uh, the um, uh, German Association for um, Anthropology of East Asia, Deutsche Gesellschaft für Natur und Völkerkunde Ostasiens, came to existence in 1871. Uh, on the German side, we have um, the Wadoku Kai, Deutsche Japanische Gesellschaft, um, established in 1890 within the Seminary for um, Oriental Languages in Berlin. Uh, this later became sadly a uh, propaganda institution of the Nazi government. And the same applies to the Society for East Asian Art, uh, which was established in 1926. Similar political con 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 correlations exist between, uh, exist for uh, two research institutes that were established in 1926 and 1927, the Institute for the Advancement of Mutual knowledge of uh, the spiritual life and public institutions in Germany and Japan, uh, the so-called Japan Institute in Berlin, in Berlin 1926, and a similar a parallel institute established in Tokyo in 1927. This, these two institutes were also highly political um, agencies. Uh, last but not least, a few individuals that operated as connectors. Uh, the most notorious was Karl Haushofer, uh, who stayed in Japan as a military observer, 1909 to 10, and returned uh, as a self-appointed Japan specialist uh, who uh, kept his voice um, throughout the, uh, the 1910s, 20s, 30s. He committed suicide in 1946. Uh, and uh, became notorious for claiming that um, he, well, he had himself been the man to educate Adolf Hitler. So he had a very strong relation to Japan and his Deutsche Akademie in Munich served as a gathering place for Japanese intellectuals in Germany. Belt's son, Erwin Tokonoske Belt, uh, played a leading role in managing um, uh, German-Japanese relations, particularly in the arts, until his death in 1945. Um, a philosopher then based in Berlin, uh, Eduard Spranger, uh, briefly uh, visited Japan as a guest, uh, as a visiting professor in 1936 to seven, uh, sorry, 37 to eight, and uh, became a prominent, um, after his return, became a prominent agent for uh, academic exchange between Japan and Germany. Um, Karl Lüwied, another philosopher, came to Japan as a refugee. Lüwied was a Jew, uh, stayed there from 19, stayed here from 1936 to 41, and then moved on to the United States. From the other, from, from Japan, we have a notorious case, Ishibashi Choi, a pediatrist, um, who, um, first 
came to Germany uh, in the 1930s. In 1938, he joined the Nazi party convention as an official guest and met Rudolf Hess. Uh, Ichibashi Choi became extremely old. He died at the age of 97. Uh, and continue to uh, organize uh, Japanese-German exchanges way down um, until uh, he passed away in 1990. Last but not least, um, I should mention um, Lili Abeck, um, who was the daughter of a Swiss silk trader, grew up in Yokohama and worked in Japan as a correspondent of the Frankfurter Zeitung, later Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, from 1934 to 1940, and then again from 1954 to 1964, uh, Lili Abeck became a very important um, interpreter of Japanese politics um, after the war. So to sum up, uh, what we have is um, this process of nationalization of uh, the relations between Europe and Japan. Um, so from the middle of the 19th century onwards, we cannot speak of a European project anymore, but uh, we have several national projects. Um, therefore, I could only uh, mention the Germans. Um, the same, similar, very similar stories have to be, uh, would have to be um, presented for the other European countries. Sadly, uh, the image of uh, the European or Western image of Japan from the mid 19th century onwards is difficult to disentangle from dominant notions of racism. Um, racism passes through uh, the various comments that we have from Europeans about Japan. To give only one case, um, Marco Polo writes uh, over and over again that people in East Asia have white color of the skin. And so do all the people who follow Marco Polo's image. By the time we get into the 18th century, all of a sudden, people in East Asia turn yellow in the European making, which means the darker the color of the skin, the weaker the culture. This is the logic with which, which, with which we have to, um, uh, which we have to recognize in uh, the European image of Japan. Uh, from the late 18th century onwards, which then manifests itself uh, after the middle of the 19th century. Thank you for attention.